Okay. Hi, and welcome, everybody. This is Robin with DFAS. I want to thank you all so much for being here today. Um, we're going to get started. We've got a great presentation with some great presenters today, but I really quickly want to go over some general housekeeping information before we get started. Um, as I mentioned, we are recording this session. What's nice about the recording is you can go back and view information you might have missed, um, or if there's other members of your team who you think would benefit from this information, they can also view this information. Um, what we will do is after the recording goes up, um, usually it will be sometime tomorrow, we'll go ahead and send out a link with the information um, that you can use to access the recording. Um, Excuse me. I do also want to mention that your phone lines are muted. Um, that's only to help with distraction from background noise, and we get so many people on the phone at the same time. But please feel free to use that chat box over on the left-hand side of your screen. If you're having any technical issues, I'm happy to help you out with that. If you have any questions for the presenters, please feel free to type those questions in there, and I will try to periodically pass them along. If I don't get to your question right away, please don't worry that we've missed it. I'm just maybe holding it till the end of the presentation as we have more time. But please feel free to use that chat as you have questions. Also, if you are on the phone line only and you're having trouble getting signed into the internet portion, feel free to send me an email to robin, R-O-B-I-N, at sanctuaryfederation.org, and I'll be happy to work with you via email to get you signed in, but please feel free to stay on the phone line while we're doing that. The only other thing I quickly wanted to mention is that a little further into the presentation when Jennifer is presenting, she's going to have um, some videos that she's going to mention to use as some examples. Because it's really difficult to nearly impossible to play videos or GIFs in this format, we're just putting up a screenshot. Jennifer will talk about it for, for a second, and not, not a long time on each one, but she'll kind of discuss it a little bit. And I will have the link listed for that particular video. So after the webinar, when you get the recording information, you can go back and view the, the more detailed videos if you'd like to. So again, if you have questions for the presenters, if you're having technical issues, please feel free to use the chat box on the left-hand side of your screen. I'll be happy to help you out. Now, it's my pleasure to go ahead and introduce your first presenter for today, Kelly Hackman, who's the Executive Director of DFAS. Kelly, I'm gonna pass it over to you. Great, thank you, Robin. Uh, and thank you for everyone um, being here today. We've got a great crowd, and it's a topic that you know, GFAS um, really feels is an important one, and I'm really glad that um, you all feel the same. So for those of you that aren't as familiar with, um, with GFAS, Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries, as our name describes, we work with animal sanctuaries all around the world. And it's our mission to continuously improve the quality of care for animals requiring sanctuaries. But who do we actually, you know, we, we use the word sanctuary, but who does that include? So for us, what we mean by sanctuary is to provide protection and care to animals, whether that's temporarily or permanently. So for us, this includes both lifelong facilities that offer permanent sanctuary, but also rescues and rehabilitation facilities that provide animals temporary or transitional sanctuary until they can find a new home or are released back into the wild. So to accomplish our mission of improving the quality of care, uh, we focus on three areas um, that are listed here. So a credit sanctuary is based on our worldwide standards of excellence, facilitate operational and financial support, and enhance effectiveness, recognition, and collaboration. And the reason why we you know, focus so much on accreditation in our, our, our program is that what we've found is that not, not all sanctuaries are created equal. There are some that do provide high levels of care but aren't necessarily all that great at providing sustainable business practices or some um, completely misrepresent the intent of the word sanctuary and fail to provide the quality of care or misrepresent um, their commercial practices uh, falsely as a sanctuary. So to battle this kind of misconception and the real um, diversity in the use of sanctuary, we really rely heavily on our accreditation program. And so we have 24 standards of excellence that all uh, feature uh, you know, species-specific guidelines for care and, and operations. 
But ultimately, what we really are trying to accomplish is providing individual animals with their five freedoms. And I'm sure you've all heard of the five freedoms, but just so that we all have them kind of here listed, it includes, you know, freedom from hunger and thirst, discomfort, pain, injury, and disease, uh, provides them with the ability to express normal behavior and the freedom from fear and distress. And one way that sanctuaries can be supportive of achieving the five freedoms is not only providing for the animals in their own care, behind the scenes, but also sending a consistent message to others. And so this is the critical piece that uh, can be challenging while trying to engage the public and getting support from them, but that's the one that will be focusing on today in this presentation. So for GFAS, um, you know, we, as I mentioned, we have the standards uh, of excellence that provide the specific guidelines, but, but when, we, when it comes to message, it actually you know, is something much broader. So the message impacts any interaction with the public and is critical even at our most boiled down requirements for accreditation. So for each one of the organizations that comes to us um, wanting to be assessed for accreditation, they must first meet our minimum eligibility criteria. And there are a variety of requirements included here, um, such as you know, no breeding or no use of an, an invasive research. But today, I want to just kind of put uh, to light some of the, the eligibility criteria that may touch upon this discussion of messaging, um, the one that, you know, the message that the public is, um, is getting from sanctuaries and rescues. So, and just to clarify, um, today when I'm referring to wild animals, um, that does include um, bird species that are commonly used for um, companions. So any bird that's not considered domestic, such as um, chickens and, and certain other species. So, for our minimum eligibility criteria, the first one that I'm going to mention is a touring practice. So in our minimum eligibility, we do restrict any unguided tours. And the reason is that sanctuaries should be a place where the welfare of the individual animals is the highest priority, as mentioned for, you know, in describing the five freedoms. And to introduce the public near their space, um, their safe area, we must be focusing on a clear educational message. So why did these animals end up here? Uh, what are the systemic problems that result in the need for sanctuaries? What can be done to create change so that wild animals stay in the wild? And if you do not have a guide or some kind of guiding system to support that message, we feel like it, it's all too easily lost. The next criteria that I wanted to just um, mention is that animals are not exhibited or taken from the sanctuary or their enclosures for non-medical reasons. So again, we're focusing on preventing any unnecessary distress. So therefore, you know, we really restrict any um, taking of the animal away from you know, that space that they find safe and for any other reason than one that's truly a benefit to the individual, such as medical care. Because when animals are taken off the sanctuary grounds, they're often put in situations where um, they have no place to hide or retreat or, you know, provide any kind of safe space to, to give them sanctuary. And this itself provides a conflicting message that it's okay to use wild animals for our purposes and often coincides with the direct handling by people, which again is an inconsistency within the messaging um, that these are wild animals. And the public does not have direct contact with wildlife. So we do not allow any contact by the public. Again, this is potentially stressful to the animal. It also provides a safety risk to both the animal and to um, the person handling the animal. And it sends an inconsistent message that, you know, the animals, um, that wild animals could be treated differently than um, if it was a domestic species. So just to kind of put this point into perspective and we have um, some, a primate sanctuary director that's going to talk a bit about messaging in, in just a bit. So would you feel comfortable showing or the handling of a monkey or a chimpanzee 
or a tiger, um, would that be an appropriate message? And, you know, we want to make sure that, you know, no matter what the species is, if it's a wild animal, that that's, you know, a consistent message to the public. And unfortunately, you know, some of these minimum eligibility conf um, have direct conflicts with, you know, some of the, the events and um, programming of some of the avian rescues that have come to us. So um, we get the question very frequently, you know, we've, we have, you know, and it's, it's laid out here, we have been taking birds to adoption events, but learned that bringing live animals out to the facilities to public events would disqualify us from becoming a GFAS accredited sanctuary. So, so really, this gets back to, um, you know, how do we present animals? How, you know, providing adoption services is really needed because there's so many birds out there that need to be rehomed. But um, one strategy that is taken is to take birds out into the public and to put them on display, you know, not uncommonly as would be done with you know, dogs and cats. But for us, this would, you know, be a disqualified practice um, given our minimum eligibility criteria that I was just mentioning. And to elaborate on why this is, um, I pulled out some of our, you know, going into the standards a little more in depth. We have, you know, policies that are specifically um, focused on public contact. And this is taken from our avian standard, which um, I didn't mention. You can go to our website, sanctuary, um, sanctuaryfederation.org, and get all of our standards, uh, download them um, to look at for yourself. But um, we feel that, you know, these adoption events compromise the welfare of the bird, causing them significant distress. Um, but really are promoting, again, that inconsistent message um, in that, you know, we want to focus on, you know, restricting public contact, uh, restrict removing animals from their enclosures, restrict direct contact, and uh, reducing, and this is something that we haven't touched upon so much, reducing the promotion of a human-animal bond with any wild animal, which, again, includes most birds. So even if you're portraying contact with trained professionals um, that work at your facility, um, either in person or photos or videos, the public really doesn't notice that that is a person that's from your facility. So what they see is that, you know, here's someone who is handling a bird or handling a primate or a tiger, and that's inconsistent messaging. We really want to avoid con confusing the public that some contact with animals is okay, but, you know, them having those same um, relationships um, is not. So we do promote um, alternatives. So instead of advocating, we advocate promoting a consistent message that provides that all birds um, in sanctuaries or even in private, private homes are provided the five freedoms. And there's a variety of ways that we feel that this can be uh, achieved. So online tools, webcams. Um, I know one of my favorite websites, you know, in the world is uh, a GFAS accredited website um, from Batworld, in which they have a, a webcam that you know you can see um, the bats at their facility night and day. Um, social media, online videos. Um, these provide the public with a view in which the birds have access to normal wild behaviors, which include, you know, the most obvious flight and social interactions with individuals of the same species. And that's what we're really trying to promote. Um, other ways that you can promote adoption is hosting events um, by focusing on streaming videos, not live animals, or having photos or providing narration of a diary um, of a rescued animal, things like that. Um, have people come to your facility and provide access to unique opportunities and tutorials. Um, for example, you can have a, a class on building your own aviary in your own home, either indoors or outdoors, generating tutorials that, you know, how do you build or put together enrichment materials. You know, bring people to your um, facility and, and that would give them opportunities to meet the the animals that you're trying to adopt. 
And then lastly, promoting a, adoption and um, by building partnerships with other like-minded um, individuals and, and organizations. So things like animal shelters or pet stores where they're going to have an audience of people that love animals. So, you know, you should, you know, take that opportunity to introduce them to the idea of, of having um, a bird as, as some as an animal that they um, can adopt. And then my last point is, um, again, we get conver- you know, questions all the time, uh, describe the kinds of public outreach efforts that we should avoid. And a lot of the other speakers are going to speak to this in much more detail. But um, you know, in addition to the, the ideas that I've already introduced already, um, we want to be careful not to mistakenly rep- misrepresent animals as forms of entertainment. And, um, you know, this is a, a pitfall that we can easily fall into in our attempts at engaging the public on social media and other forms of, of communication. And so it's really just kind of a, a cautionary tale that we always want to remember what message we're trying to send. So with that, um, you know, that's kind of the GFAS perspective but um, now I'm going to hand it over to Denise Kelly, who um, we've been collaborating with. Now this is our third uh, National Bird Day with, uh, in collaboration with uh, Denise with the Avian Welfare Coalition. So I'm going to hand it over to her so she can introduce herself and um, the speakers for the rest of the presentation. Hi. Thank so you Denise. all. For- <laughs> yes, I'm here. Thank you all for joining us today. Uh, to all our registrants, and a special thanks to the Global Federation of Animal Sanctuaries and to Kelly and Robin for all this amazing work that they've um, achieved on our webinar series. I'm really lucky to have such a great team to work with, and um, getting to the AWC. We began in 2000 as a group working to bring awareness regarding captive bird welfare issues and to serve as an educational resource to the animal protection community, lawmakers, and the general public. And one of the key goals that we started out to address was the growing need for bona fide sanctuary and shelter for displaced birds. And we that led us to establish a dedicated shelter outreach program, um, which the focus was is designed to help shelters tend to the short-term needs of exotic birds within a shelter environment. Um, we felt that at the, engaging the resources that were already out there and the infrastructure of well-run animal shelters would enable us to expand our partnerships and be able to serve more birds in need. So we established that program with that in mind. Um, Our partnership with GFAS enabled us to expand that, and so far we've produced um, three series of webinars uh, that serve the needs of captive birds, Um, from care in the shelter, direct care in the shelter, to placement, and to forming alliances, outreach, and estate planning for people who already have birds who... um, because obviously birds live, some of them live a very long time, and there are special considerations that go into people who want to make a a plan long term. These are all available. Uh, We made it really simple to um, remember the name. It's um, avianwelfare.org backslash webinars. So all of the webinars that we produced with GFAST is also available on their website. So you can go back and look, and I strongly encourage everyone to um, take a look at those and listen. This latest series is devoted to the long overdue topic of avian advocacy. Um, And the presenters that will be coming up uh, will be um, giving you some tips on how to more effectively advocate for captive birds avoid some of the more challenging aspects of educational outreach, um, and the unintended consequences that could come that you're not perhaps 
recognizing as you're in your program. Um, and the importance of consistency in sending the right message that will promote change. And to put Kelly's words on the five freedoms into perspective, these principles are used to evaluate the humane treatment of animals in any given situation. And they really do provide a framework that can be applied to every aspect of bird care and treatment. Very simple, but they, they really do speak to it. And they provide a basis not only for direct care that you can think about when you're doing direct care, does it meet the five freedoms, but they can also be applied throughout your educational messaging and outreach. So keep that in mind, and with that, I'm going to turn this over to our presenters. J.B. Mulcahy is the co-director of the Chimpanzee Sanctuary Northwest, and um, you can read his bio there. Jennifer Place is a program associate at Board Free USA, and she manages our National Bird Day campaign. So without further ado, I'm going to turn this over to um, them. Thanks, Denise, and uh, thanks to everybody for joining. Uh, I'm really excited to talk about this. Um, I'll be highlighting a lot of the things that uh, Kelly has already mentioned and, and taking the the goals outlined by Kelly and, and putting them in a context of messaging. Uh, so this first slide here, um, just to broaden it out a little bit, is to, is to talk about developing an effective advocacy strategy. And of course, messaging is just one part of that, an important part, but just one part. Uh, when you start to develop uh, a new advocacy campaign, the first step is to ask a question, and that is, what is your goal with this campaign? What do you want this campaign to accomplish, this advocacy campaign? Uh, and as Kelly mentioned, for for sanctuaries and for rescues, the highest priority needs to be the welfare and well-being of the wild animals in your care. Um, and that goal, that priority needs to be reflected consistently in your messaging. Messaging is, is as I said, very vital to any campaign. And the message you put out into the world can either reinforce your priorities and your goals, or it can be counterproductive. It can be a very powerful, effective tool, or it can be an obstacle. Uh, so coming up with a consistent message uh, that is consistent with your goals is, is a must. Of course, that's easier said than done, especially when it comes to captive exotic birds. Advocating for birds isn't easy. Uh, there are many issues facing them, and uh, it's a very nuanced and complex subject. Just to take one aspect of that, how do you effectively educate the public that the exotic birds in your care are wild animals, they're high maintenance and intelligent, and they have complex needs, and they live a long time? Well, how do you pair that with successfully placing them in forever homes? How do you call them wild on one hand and then educate the best ways to meet their needs in captivity on the other? And to do this, I uh, to explain this a little bit further, I am going to look at our own National Bird Day as an example. In the end, the answer to effective, productive advocacy messaging for birds can be found in two words, consistency and empathy. Empathy is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So in this case, it's the ability to understand the feelings and experiences of the birds you're advocating for. Empathy, thinking first of the bird's welfare and needs must be consistent in every message you put out because that's what you want the public to take away. Every social media post, every video, every interview, every fundraiser, every event you put on needs to be consistent and consistently empathetic. Uh, so National Bird Day got its start 15 years ago. It takes place on January 5th every year, intentionally coinciding with the end of the annual Christmas bird count, which is a three week citizen science survey for our native bird populations. The, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service estimates that there are 10 million native birds in the wild that breed in the U.S. every year. 
However, no federal agency has a similar estimate for the number of exotic birds living and being bred in captivity in the U.S., although several reports have shown that there are at least 10 million and probably more. And that's precisely the goal for National Bird Day, is to shift the focus for one day from our native birds to the exotic birds who aren't native to the U.S., but are here nonetheless. So on the National Bird Day website, you'll find information on how exotic bird species are increasingly threatened with extinction in the wild, and on how exotic birds are wild animals that don't belong in captivity. You'll find blog posts that caution against promoting exotic birds as good pets, but you'll also find lists on how to keep your captive pet bird happy. So while these resources certainly don't sound consistent at first glance, I would argue that they are because they are focused on the well-being of birds and on thinking about birds from their own point of view, which is the overarching theme of National Bird Day. So to help further clarify that overarching theme, the National Bird Day website incorporates three specific points that resonate in every single message we put out into the world. These have become our consistent talking points that help us and the public think about the issues that face exotic birds. So these three messages, and, and they need to go in order, are first, birds, everything from African gray parrots to the, small, to the smallest, quote, starter cockatiel you find at Petco, are wild animals. They belong in the wild in their own habitat with the freedoms to fly, forage, and flock. Just by its very nature, a house cannot match treetops and an open sky. So therefore, it is next to impossible to fully meet a bird's needs when it's in captivity. However, and this is the second message, we must live within reality. And the reality is there are countless birds in this country who have been bred and born in captivity that can never be released into the wild. Many of these birds face stress, neglect, and abandonment. Therefore, their only path to better lives is to be rescued and adopted by those who are fully prepared and dedicated to their proper care for their full lifetimes, which is no easy task. That makes our third message, uh, that focuses our third message on giving captive exotic birds the best possible life. We first urge would-be bird owners to do their research and learn exactly what they're getting into before bringing a bird into their home. The responsibility of owning and caring for a captive exotic bird is massive, but of course so is the reward. So after all that research, if they still want to care for a bird, we then urge them to rescue a bird in need instead of going to a pet store. And at the end, we offer guidance for bird owners on how to give their birds the best possible care. So you see this in practice in the screenshot uh, on this slide of a um, web page on the National Bird Day website. This is our list of 10 things you can do to keep your bird happy. And it may be a little hard to see, uh, so you can just see it on the National Bird Day website. Uh, it's a little, it's a disclaimer and explanatory statement, um, really highlighting those those levels of messages. Uh, and, and you see that throughout the website. And that's how, uh, that's how we stay consistent uh, and, and clear. So that brings me to our, um, our topic on bird videos and, and really trying to focus on the question on if videos are a good way to uh, promote birds. Uh, one of the biggest messaging hurdles is how to get people to pay attention to and fall in love with exotic birds while still staying consistent with your other messages. Exotic birds are wild animals, they're high maintenance, they need constant attention and enrichment, etc. So how to use videos while also staying true to your number one priority, which is the well-being of birds. Videos can be a very effective medium to getting attention for your birds, but there's a right way and a wrong way. Type cute bird video into YouTube and you'll see it can be very easy to get the birds in your care millions of views. But what's the use in a viral video if what it is conveying is counterproductive to what you and your organization stand for? What's the benefit in millions of views if it ends up hurting the very animals you're trying to help? The truth is these viral videos inadvertently promote the myth that birds are easy, low maintenance, silly, domesticated pets. Many times the birds are put in stressful or dangerous situations for pure entertainment value. 
our focus for the National Bird Day campaign in 2016 was exactly on these type of videos. So if you'd like to learn more, please go to our National Bird Day website. But for now, I'm just going to focus on a few bad examples. So this is a screenshot from a video. Um, this is Eric, and his owner routinely posts videos of him being naughty. And that's that's what she calls him. In this video uh, that uh, you can link to a GIF here, um, this video has 2.1 million views on YouTube. And in it, uh, Eric's owner is aggressively yelling at him while filming him tossing coins. I have no doubt that she loves Eric, but in her videos, she promotes and encourages Eric's bad, somewhat destructive behavior purely for entertainment value. And who's to say that Eric even realizes that what he is doing is bad? This is Max, and in this video, his owner is filming him while telling him he has to go to the vet. Max first hides under a shelf in the closet, then, when he's not left alone, he goes to another room and hides under a table. This video has a whopping 12.5 million views, but what's really happening here? Max's owner is following him around with a camera while Max is exhibiting signs of stress and discomfort. Is Max enjoying this, or is it just the 12.5 million people who are watching him? This is Baby and his owner. In this video, Baby's owner is yelling at him to get on his finger and then continuing to yell at him when Baby doesn't do it and instead uses some swear words. This video has 7.1 million views. The entertainment value is in Baby's potty mouth, but all I can see, and I've never been able to make it through this entire video, is, ba is a stressed out animal whose caretaker is being aggressive with him. But that said, videos can be used in a way that is consistent with your other empathetic messaging. The do's are pretty simple. Birds doing their thing in their own way and at their own pace is plenty entertaining. And if you don't integrate, I'd only point you to David Attenborough's work. Please keep in mind that videos are just one promotional tool. As Kelly mentioned, there are many other tools available to you, and I would strongly encourage you to look into setting up live cams and enclosures or using Facebook Live. Success stories and rescue stories can also be wonderfully effective at getting attention for your birds while also helping the public think about birds from a different perspective, from their perspective. So there are some videos that do that. Uh, the first, actually, they are both from Oasis Sanctuary. Uh, this first one is a, a video, a screenshot of Oscar the African Gray Parrot. Um, he is exhibiting some natural behaviors in a more wild, natural environment. You notice there are no humans in the shot. This screenshot is uh, of a video that's very near and dear to my heart. In 2015, Born for USA worked with Oasis Sanctuary to rescue nearly 50 cockatiels from a hoarding situation in Escanaba, Michigan. This video shows those cockatiels being released from quarantine. If you watch the full video, you'll see a caretaker opening the carrier and coaxing, coaxing the birds out, but she doesn't force them or interfere with them in any way. She lets them come out or not at her own pace, and it's, it's impossibly adorable and uh, it did not have to be contrived in any way. So we've discussed consistent empathetic messaging both on your website and through promotional mediums, but I want to take just a minute to focus on a specific audience, children. Children are an important key to a better future for exotic birds, but in order to utilize that key, you need to find a way to educate without giving the false impression that birds are good pets. One of the best ways that we found to do that is through a children's book based on a remarkable true story. This book, uh, and the cover is right there on your screen, tells the story of Lucky the Lorikeet. He was first captured in the wild, and he eventually regained his freedom with the help of a compassionate young boy who was first his owner and then became his rescuer. And with that, I will uh, hand the mic over to JB. JB, are JB, you you're talking, muted? we can't hear you. Can you, can you hear me? It, um, it, the audio yes. cut out on me. 
Okay, sorry. Okay, we can hear you now. Okay. No problem. We can hear you now. Okay. <laughs> Um, so uh, the question is, um, you, you know, primates and parrots share this common problem in that they exhibit these human-like um, qualities that lead people to try to companionize them. So how do we break down these stereotypes and, and get attention focused on the issues that are important? Uh, I'm sure everyone here uh, on this call is familiar with the way that primates are, are typically portrayed in TV, in print ads, on greeting cards, and social media. Uh, we see them presented as these sort of goofy, slapstick versions of ourselves. And as this question suggests, this creates a false and often dangerous impression uh, of what these animals are really like. Um, and that leads to their further exploitation in the entertainment industry and drives to the community space head on in order to uh, fulfill our, our mission to protect them and also to reduce the burden on sanctuaries that care for the cast-offs. There are two ways of looking at our role in this uh, problem. Uh, one is that we need to push back forcefully against this type of betrayal and work on educating people about primate behavior and the consequences of using primates in entertainment and keeping them as pets. So this takes a, a really concerted uh, effort. Um, we need to use our, our platforms to teach people what these behaviors uh, really mean. So for example, um, with primates, the big toothy uh, grins that you often see, um, like on this uh, chimpanzee um, on the screen right now, um, are actually fear grimaces or threat expressions from many primate species. So the primates depicted in the media this way are either fearful themselves or they've been trained through coercive methods to produce these uh, behaviors on cue. Um, so that's a message that we've worked very hard to get across. And our individual sanctuaries, as big or small they might be, may not be able to reach everyone. Um, but by teaching our own constituents about their natural behavior, they become educators uh, themselves. Um, and we've seen uh, success in this, that reflected not just in uh, consumer behavior, um, but also in the industries um, themselves, like advertising, where many agencies have vowed uh, to no longer use live primates in their work. Um, another way of looking at a role in this problem is, uh, as we've mentioned already uh, today, is that we need to think very critically about the way that we portray the animals in our care. And uh, I'll be the first to admit that uh, our sanctuary um, has struggled with this issue, and we struggle on a daily basis with it. Um, a big part of our mission is to develop empathy uh, for non-human primates. And one significant way that we do that is by showing how similar they are to humans. Um, but we need to be sure that we aren't exploiting those same stereotypes that we're fighting against just to drive attention to our own organization. And again, it's all too easy for us to confuse the number of likes or shares that we get on a Facebook post with a metric of success in our educational outreach, uh, because that reach doesn't help if it's not delivering the message. So we try to remind ourselves that we can showcase these amazing behaviors that have such great potential to develop empathy, uh, but we can do it in a way that places them in the context of the species' natural behavior. So for primates, um, that means we can focus on things like uh, tool use, uh, the way that uh, primates bond with one another through play, these behaviors that are so fascinating to people and um, so reflective of qualities that we see in ourselves. Um, but we can do it in a way that demonstrates how their natural abilities and try to give our audience uh, that sense of empathy, but also a deeper understanding of and appreciation for the species. Um, and at the same time, because our goal is to end the use of primates in entertainment and as pets, uh, we can also uh, focus attention on these human-like behaviors, um, again, in context, but demonstrate how these things like intelligence, um, emotional capacity, uh, sociality, how these things make these animals particularly unsuitable uh, for life in captivity, which can never really meet all of their complex needs. Um, so, 
that could be um, uh, applied to an effective education program for parents. Um, I would say uh, the main thing that we can offer um, as a community is um, that we've learned that we are just far more effective when we coordinate our efforts. Um, so this can be done through formal coalition building. Um, I'm here today uh, representing NAPSA, which is the North American Primate Sanctuary Alliance. Um, and NAPSA, through the work of its uh, Public Affairs Committee and its program director, helps all of its member sanctuaries coordinate their messaging um, so that we can speak together with one voice. Uh, it also helps us respond quickly and effectively to negative portrayals of primates in the media, including uh, all those viral videos you see of orangutan and dogs together and things like that um, on social media. Um, so by coordinating, our message is well-developed, and again, it's consistent across organizations. Um, we can also use this coordination to position ourselves as the relevant group of experts for media to consult with if there's a controversial issue. So, for example, on your screen there you see um, uh, use of monkeys in these monkey rodeos, which is a, a perfect example of um, a portrayal that we need to push back very forcefully against. Um, and by working together um, in an alliance, um, we are sought out um, to give input when the media is uh, running a story on this. Um, we can then use that, promote it to all of our members, and, um, and help uh, promote action against this type of thing. And finally, in addition to um, these formal coalitions, um, we've learned as hard as it is, because we all tend to work better with uh, non-human animals than with other humans, um, but cooperation is key. Uh, looking beyond our own coalition, we learn to uh, work well with groups outside of our immediate community. Um, that could be the larger animal welfare groups, conservation organizations, scientific associations, public safety advocates, and so on. Um, so for just one example, our own sanctuary, along with others, and the larger animal protection groups, uh, was part of a sustained effort to target uh, Dodge for their use of a chimpanzee in a TV and print advertising campaign. And while our own uh, sanctuary is relatively small, the collective pressure against Dodge was uh, significant, and we were perceived as experts and very quickly received a signed letter from the CEO of Dodge uh, explaining that they would immediately remove the ads and uh, vowed to not use live primates again in their advertising, which is obviously very helpful not only to those primates in the ad, but to our uh, mission as a whole. Um, so by working together, we were able to take on this huge corporation and preempt what would have been a, a widely seen and very harmful portrayal of a non-human primate. Thank you, JB. Um, the next few slides, everybody, are some, some questions that we're going to kind of ask any of our presenters to comment on. So to get started, um, the first question, we were recently interviewed for an article on the problem of unwanted birds. The reporter turned the story into a fluff piece and neglected to bring up the most important facts. <clears throat> Excuse me. Any tips on dealing with reporters and getting them to cover the story appropriately? Um, did you want to start with this, JB, and then we can see if Jennifer or anybody else has anything to add? I think uh, Jennifer is going to take this one first. Oh, I'm sorry. Jennifer, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Uh, so uh, this, is, this is a wonderful question and certainly something that you run into a lot. Uh, and as my uh, As Born Free's crack PR consultant would tell you, reporters don't have any attention span. They're overworked and they really just want you to do their work for them. So. Uh, so this is a really good topic to cover. Uh, I would say that the very first thing is is to understand that you don't have any control over a reporter and what the reporter ultimately writes or doesn't write. Uh, unlike your website, social media sites, um, you 
are not talking directly to your audience, uh, to your potential donors, to your pr prospective adopters. Um, you're not talking directly to them, you're talking to a reporter. So the reporter becomes the middleman. So one thing that you can do just in general to combat fluff pieces and mis misinformation is to keep the messaging that you do control on your websites and on social media, uh, keep it clear, keep it clear and keep it consistent, which is which is what we've been talking about. Um, and then when you're actually dealing with a reporter, it's you really need to focus on how to get them to listen. So while staying consistent with your messaging, you also have to be as simple as possible. Um, you want to oversimplify, but you also don't want to say anything off message. So um, developing elevator pitches for each one of the facts, the points you want to get across is, is a really good thing to do. Um, and I would also suggest that when you're dealing with a, a reporter, um, put your quotes in text with, with quotes around them. Uh, and because they can't be, it can't turn into a fluff piece if they're quoting you directly. Um, another another tip would be to focus on the right media. Um, if you want serious stories, then you, you need to stay away from the outlets that only promote fluff, uh, unless you know a reporter at that specific outlet gets it and understands your issues and wants to advocate for them as well. Uh, I would also suggest that maybe sometimes um, a fluff piece that comes out isn't the worst thing as long as it is still full of accurate information. The real thing that you want to avoid is misinformation. Thank you, Jennifer. Did anybody else want to comment before I move on to the next one? Okay. The next question is, the problem of unwanted birds is often referred to as a hidden crisis. How do you gain support for a cause that is not yet recognized by the public or gaining enough attention by the animal protection community? I think, JB, were you going to take this one first? Um, sure, I can. Um, I, you know, for us, I think the, the thing that we try to focus on is um, storytelling. Um, so, you know, this is a hidden crisis to the outside world, but but we are dealing with this crisis every day. We are the ones caring for the animals affected by um, this crisis. And each of those animals has a story that we can share. And one of the um, most effective things about storytelling is that people, even people that are sympathetic to our cause, don't like to be preached to. Um, and it's also very difficult for people to understand and try to take action on problems that are abstract. Um, and so by telling the stories, telling the story of a chimpanzee that was captured in Africa as an infant, uh, was in the circus for nine years, um, then spent 20 years in a five foot by five foot cage in a laboratory. Um, all of these things are, are things that people don't necessarily want to hear, but as they're drawn into the story of Jamie and the other primates in our care, um, they're learning about the extent of this crisis, and they're also learning about it in a way that makes them uh, less uh, defensive and more open to learning more and, and to eventually taking action on it. Thank you, JB. Um, did anybody else want to comment before we move on? Uh, just to jump in, this is this is Jennifer. Just to jump in and reiterate everything that that JB has said. Um, actually, for this year's National Bird Day campaign, we focused a lot on rescue stories and getting the stories out there, uh, stories of from the people themselves who have dedicated dedicated their lives to caretaking, uh, to the care of uh, exotic birds that, that needed to be rescued that had come from uh, really difficult circumstances. Uh, and just on a broader note, um, how do you gain support for a cause that is not yet recognized? You, you, keep, you keep getting your message out there. So it's, it's not only about consistency, it's also about persistence. Uh, and, and really pushing out that message every opportunity you get. Thank you, Jennifer. The next question I'll, I'll leave um, to any of the presenters that want to jump in. A lot of our donors have birds. 
How do we take a strong stand against the exotic bird trade while at the same time try to encourage people to adopt birds? I don't know who wanted to jump in first. Who wanted to comment on this? Ed, I can I can jump in here. It's um, it's it's another really good question uh, because you you do need funds to, to keep your organization going to uh, to effectively campaign, uh, but you also need to stay stay consistent. Uh, and I think that um, some of the things that we do on our National Bird Day site could really help here. Just walking your donors and um, anybody who visits your site through through the logic um, of exotic birds and through the issues that they face. Um, so you can stand against the exotic bird trade while also accepting the reality that the bird trade exists and there are victims of that bird trade and those victims need to be taken care of. Thank you. Actually, I, Mr. Kelly I, one suggestion, this is Denise Kelly. Um, I, I think you wanna avoid shaming people um, for having birds because what we found is that a lot of people come to the conclusion after living with these animals, they come to that conclusion on their own. And I think a lot of sanctuaries will tell you the same thing. It's, it's the, I wish I knew before I got the bird. So I think you try to make them part of the solution. And again, I think referring to the five freedoms to sort of reiterate that this is why you feel this way, that these birds need are so woefully, you know, we, you know, captivity does not serve them. And you're not trying to shame anybody, but you're really trying to get the point across. And I think most people will accept that as a message. And I think they will become, you know, partners in it. And, and they, they really feel after a while living with these birds that many come to that conclusion on their own. So I, I think you use those as examples. Great. Thank you, Denise. Did anybody else want to comment before I move on? Okay, the next question. We have to take our birds off-site to comply with our Federal Migratory Bird Special Purpose Possession Education Permit. How can I meet those requirements and maintain a consistent message? And this is Kelly. I wanted to just jump in here for, for this one. So um, so this is fish and wildlife uh, requirement, and it's only, you know, only certain specific native species are affected by this, but it is, you know, when we do get applications from rehabilitation centers and some avian rescues, they do deal with this specific issue. And so we reached out to fish and wildlife and asked them about their requirements and what they actually meant by education, because a lot of people just um, infer that it means an off-site educational component. And um, the person that I spoke with, who is the, the national coordinator, said that you can keep birds and their enclosures on site and still meet these guidelines. So for them, their message um, is a little bit different than, than what we would normally um, focus on as a sanctuary. Um, they really want to have an introduction of, of conservation and you know, the importance of, of natural wildlife. But, um, but that can still be done and be consistent if you maintain your education program on site, which, you know, sometimes there's a little bit of a regional um, flexibility in how the officers interpret the requirements. But um, as long as you are providing 12 opportunities to talk about conservation with an audience, then um, I think very often your um, permitting officer will will find that to be acceptable. So I just I'm really happy to address that question. Thank you, Kelly. Did anybody else want to comment before I move on to the next one? Okay. I believe this might be our last question in the slides, and then we do have a couple of questions we can get to over in the chat. 
Um, but this question asks, give us some examples of big picture themes we could focus on to create a public awareness campaign for captive birds. Did somebody want to start with that one? I think uh, this is Jen again. I think looking to the National Bird Day website uh, is, is a really good idea for this. Um, our overarching theme is to encourage people to think about birds from their perspective. Uh, and one of our taglines that we have in our National Bird Day posters every year is think outside the cage, which is really encouraging um, the public to think about the birds, um, not not in terms of how it relates to our everyday life, but you know how it how they actually live in the wild, uh, and that that's a really good starting point. Um, but I've noticed that uh, in the in the chat, um, there have been some other really good themes that have come up: uh, uh, education initiatives and um, awareness raising themes and. Uh, it's it's really it's it's whatever speaks to you and and the needs of your organization, um, keeping keeping in theme with um, with being empathetic towards the birds and making the well being of birds your highest priority. Thank you, Jen. Did anybody else want to comment on this one? I I think the think outside the cage or thinking outside the cage really is applicable applicable to so many things, um, thinking outside the cage as far as care standards, thinking outside the cage as far as education. It, it really it does have a great ring to it because I think it can be applied to, you know, figuratively or literally. So um, that is a, a really good one. One of the other things we tried to um, get the um, big picture theme is that to think about parrots as we would think about our own native birds that the the sort of irony that that we that we look at our own native birds and we we've provided all kinds of protections from commercialization yet we take the birds of other countries that are equally as complex have the same basic needs and somehow we have this concept that there is such a thing as a caged bird but there really isn't so think outside the cage again is like we should be thinking outside the cage for all birds. They should all be outside the cage. So. Thank you, Denise. Um, let me go ahead. I, Denise, did you want to comment about these additional resources? At all? Um, and I will like mention that. Go ahead, who is that? Oh, I'm sorry. That was Robin. I was just going to say that okay. we do have these additional resources listed. Um, when we have the recording available and I send you information about the recording, I'll make sure you get this list so that you can easily have some links to click through them. <clears throat> I think the one I'd like to highlight is the welfare and suitability of parrots as companion animals because that whole article is based on the five freedoms and um, how it relates to birds in captivity. And I think it's it's really a, a, a terrific uh, uh, article um, that speaks in more detail to what Kelly was talking about earlier. And advocacy Thank 101 you. for USA yes. <laughs> is one of the best <laughs> I, I, compilations of, of ways to advocate. And uh, Jen, would you like to continue on that? Because I think that is one of the best uh, um, guides I've, I've seen. Sure. Uh, so um, Denise actually brought this to my attention, this, this web page, um, showing her familiarity more, more than me with the uh, Born Free USA resources. It's, it's a really great tool uh, to get you thinking about how to start building, start developing a campaign and the different components that you need to think about uh, when you are developing an advocacy campaign. Because as I said at the beginning, while messaging is vital to every advocacy campaign, it really is only one 
facet. Uh, so I would really encourage you to click that link and, and read through it. And of course, let me know uh, or Born Free know if uh, you have any questions that come up from that or if uh, you need any additional information. Thank you. Um, I wanted to quickly let everybody know this really concludes this session of the formal webinar. We do have a couple questions I want to pass along to the presenters, but if any people need to, to log off, we totally understand. I will get you, as I mentioned, more information um, regarding the recording and links to the videos and the resources that we talked about here once that is all set and ready to go. Um, and I do want to say, in case anybody needs to sign off, a huge thank you to all of you for attending today. It was a great turnout. Um, really, really great presentation. Thank you to Kelly and to Denise and to Jen and to JB. Um, I think you all did a great job, and it was a really great presentation, so I appreciate that. Um, I'm going to quickly run through a couple of these questions that we received. If I don't get to it, um, we'll see if we can pass it along to one of the, the presenters to possibly respond via email. So I wanted to start with, we had a question saying, it was mentioned to partner with pet stores. I've heard of bird rescues working with stores that sell birds and other animals. Shouldn't we only be working with stores that sell supplies only? Is there anybody that wanted to comment on that? Well, I think that was it was my my comment that is being referred to. So, I mean, obviously, again, if we're trying to be consistent in the messaging, then it's definitely um, most ideal to be partnering with groups that have a similar message. So I totally agree that, you know, if, if there's um, partners that aren't selling birds, which is completely, you know, in contrast to the message you're trying to send, definitely um, make those partnerships a priority. Um, but yeah, I, I, I definitely agree that we should try to be consistent with um, the messaging our partners are, are presenting out to. Thank you. Um, during the presentation specifically about the YouTube videos, um, it was mentioned that the birds are referred to um, by people as owners. Should, should we stay away from the term owner in our messaging? So that was during my portion and um, and good catch, I did use the word owner a few times, uh, and I think throughout my presentation, I would go back and forth between owner and and caretaker. Um, I, I would actually turn to Denise for guidance on that question, if she wants to take it. Well, from the legal standpoint, you know, owner, we had a, in one of our other uh, webinars, uh, a whole discussion, um, I believe it was with Jane Hoffman uh, from the Mayor's Alliance in New York City's Animals, um, on the in terminology within an adoption contract that, you know, for legal purposes, sometimes that is the right word. Yes, I think when we talk about guardian or caretaker, when we're talking about in the practical sense of these animals, yes, um, you want you want to stay away from the word owner, but, you know, for legal reasons and and things, there you you might have to use that, you know. But we don't really own any animals anyway. We all know that they own us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer and Denise. So um, I I think that's all that I've got right now. So. Again, I want to say a huge thank you to everybody for attending. Thank you so much to the presenters. I don't know if anybody had any last comments they wanted to make before we sign off, so I'll give the presenters an opportunity to do that. If well, anyone I wanna, has any other this questions, is Kelly. Um, I'm happy to answer them afterward if you want to just forward them on. Yep, I sure will. Yeah, obviously, if you if you continue to have any questions, um, so you can send them to Robin at robin at sanctuaryfederation.org, um, and we can get them to the right speakers um, to address any additional questions that might pop in your head later on. I do want to mention that we have, um, this is a, a two-part series, um, and this is just the first of the two. So next week, we will have another webinar on um, the law. So we're going to dive into some of the 
international, national, and state level um, legal considerations in protecting um, the bird specifically. So that'll be exciting. So make sure that um, you register for that. Um, and then I also just wanted to thank um, you know, our presenters today, JB and Jennifer, um, for providing a unique insight into you know, how we can you know, be more considerate of our messaging and more tactical and and um, they've really made it an, a special presentation today. So um, that's the final word that I had. Denise, did you have any closing? Thank, thank you. you. Oh, just thank you, everybody, for, for attending and to everyone who worked on this um, terrific and presentation. Great. Thank you again, well, everybody. Well, oh, I'm sorry. I did somebody want to jump to in see with something else? Next week. I... <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Thank you again, everybody. Um, and again, follow. Feel free to follow up with with me with via email if you have any other questions. And have a good day. Bye, everyone. Thanks. Bye, bye.